I have actually started uh, to work on nosocomial infections relatively early when I came from Germany. I already worked uh, in a staphylococcal lab and from there I brought uh, the interest in uh, staph epidermidis and the more uh, I would say chronic pathogens as opposed to um, the more acutely virulent staph aureus. So when I started the NIID um, we mostly worked on staph epidermidis and, and biofilm formation. So our contribution to the field would be mostly in elucidating uh, the mechanisms of biofilm formation. Almost all staphylococcal species um, are able um, to cause infections on indwelling medical devices, usually in forming these, these agglomerations that we call biofilms. Um, how severe such an infection uh, becomes depends mostly on what kind of bug um, is involved, so Staphylococcus aureus tends to be a bigger problem normally. And it also depends on uh, the status of antibiotic resistance of, of the bugs. Um, for example, um, most Staphylococcus epidermidis isolates um, that we have in hospitals are nowadays resistant to methicillin, about 80 or 90% in the United States. That means that methicillin or these are, or other um, penicillin-derived antibiotics are definitely not um, antibiotics of choice anymore um, for these infections. That aureus usually causes more trouble just because it has the capacity uh, to cause more severe infections. So then um, a, a catheter-related infection or an infection on an indwelling medical device can be the source for a second site infection. That's something that the Ceph epidermis and the others usually don't do to that extent. But if it's Ceph aureus, it can go somewhere else and it, cause, it can cause really life-threatening infections. This is a relatively recent development. So these, these are peptides that we just discovered, um, published on that two years ago. So that's very new. These are a new class of staphylococcal toxins. And um, what they do, as you said, correctly is that they, they poke holes in neutrophils and uh, neutrophilic cells are the main um, defenders of the human body against the bacterial infection because usually they would take up the bacteria and when the bacteria are inside the neutrophils um, then the white blood cells would destroy the, the bacteria. Now these phenol soluble modulin peptides um, basically are the bacteria's weapon to fight back. And they, they do very similar things with the neutrophils. The neutrophils would like to do with the bacteria, which is poke holes in them, uh, which, which destroys them. And so there, there we see uh, how this, this, this very, um, very tight interaction between neutrophils and the bacteria, how they have evolved to, to combat each other during evolution. Biofilm-related infection, infection on indwelling medical devices. I think there is no big discussion that this tends to be a chronic infection. We really have to distinguish that from, from, from um, the, these acute infections that only Staph aureus causes, like uh, toxic shock uh, syndrome um, or, or acu acute sepsis or so. It's something that's very, very rare um, with, with other bugs. Well, we have to leave the Staph epidermidis field here. We were talking now mostly about Staphylococcus aureus, where clearly uh, the device-associated infections are only part of the infections that the organism can cause. So something that has been um, all over the media over the last two or three years are these so-called community-associated infections, where, where we leave the, the setting of a hospital completely. So the new thing here is um, we, we always had infections that occurred in the community, but these were usually not caused by strains that were methicillin resistant. So, so the big thing is here that MRSA, infamous MRSA, is not limited to hospitals anymore, but can infect healthy patients in a community setting. So um, what we were mostly interested in as uh, pathogenesis researchers uh, more recently was what makes these strains more virulent? What makes them so aggressive that they can attack healthy people, football players, gymnasts, you know, high, high school um, students? Um, and we think, and there, there, it's an intensely debated field, and, and we think that um, increased expression, for example, of these phenol soluble that we 
um, that we talked about, but also increased expression of other toxins contributes to the increased virulence potential of these strains. There are medical biofilms that tend to be polymicrobial. Um, for example, the typical dental plagues. There are super polymicrobial. There are hundreds of species involved there, and we, we, we have no clue yet, and you can imagine how difficult that is to, to be investigated in a laboratory. We have no clue yet on how they really interact, um, how maybe species that we're not even able to culture um, might influence um, the physiology of such a polymicrobial biofilm. And then, as you mentioned, you know, um, what that means for antibiotic resistance, what that means, for example, also for horizontal gene transfer, that one uh, bacteria might spread uh, antimicrobial resistance that it has acquired to all the others in the polymicrobial biofilm. I think we, we, we know that this is going on, but we are far from understanding you know, how much that matters. Probably it will matter a lot. <laughs> In the Netherlands, for example, there are clear search and destroy policies. When MRSA um, is found somewhere, then it, this is followed up with um, really back to the, uh, to maybe to the family origin where it came from, decontamination is set in place. Something that's not present in the United States and, and, and as a consequence, uh, MRSA infections here tend to be at a very high frequency. So um, cleanliness is definitely very important. For, for community-associated infections, it's very easy to just, just use soap and water, which, which will get rid of MRSA on, on hands um, and, and so forth. Um, people have, maybe, maybe I can add a little bit on that search and destroy thing, because um, there, there's a big discussion going on, why, why isn't that initiated in the United States? Um, so people from the Netherlands, for example, or some other uh, Scandin Scandinavian countries mostly that have very, very low MRSA infection rates. They, of course, would suggest to do the same thing here, but then there are other people um, from the clinical field, and I have to admit that's not so much my expertise, but uh, I hear from my friends from the clinics, they tell me, well, maybe it's already too late in the United States, which is a little bit pessimistic view, but it might be true. Um, for example, there are um, necrotizing pneumonia necrotizing fasciitis, osteomyelitis, endocarditis, they are definitely severe infections that these strains may cause. And then you definitely need antibiotics that help. So what usually happens is that one, one of course, tries antibiotics. And in most cases, one has to um, accept that the antibiotics do work. I mean, even for multidrug resistant strains, there's always still now vancomycin. Well, once in a while, that might not work. And then the only thing that works is taking the catheter out and putting a new one in. And if that's more than a catheter, if it's a, uh, if it's a let's say, a prosthesis replace, pr replacement or so, that's of course uh, not very nice for the patient, also very cost um, effective. Um, there are, if you're going to, to basic research and what, what researchers uh, try to do uh, against this and trying to find new therapeutics, or new ways to combat these infections, there are two main ways. Uh, there are more the material researchers who try to improve the material of the catheter, meaning that they change the surface so bacteria are becoming less attracted and they, they stick less to the, um, bacteria, to the material surface. On the other hand, there are molecular biologists, immunologists, and so forth, and we are trying to understand um, by which means the bacteria cause a biofilm so that we would be able to directly um, target with novel therapeutics uh, the genes and proteins that are, or other molecules that are involved in, in biofilm formation. Quite unfortunately, I have to say, uh, none of these two approaches has really worked out that well so far. Um, on the material side, um, there has been improvement, of course, but what happens uh, in the human body is that whatever materials to, to you stick in, the human body covers it relatively soon with matrix proteins. And the bacteria are very good in attaching to these matrix proteins, so that in the end, what is, a, what is the material surface doesn't really matter that much. And, and as a consequence, I mean, no, no matter what um, these people have come up with, um, the bacteria were still, able, were still able to form a biofilm. And the same is also true for the other side. There hasn't been so much um, success because um, biofilm formation by most bacteria tends to be multifactorial. And um, it's very difficult to come up with a therapeutic 
that targets all these many things. This is why people were so euphoric about the quorum sensing blockers, which might not have turned out that well in the end. So, so there again, we're trying a lot, but the the um, the redundance of these biofilm factors causes us a lot of trouble.